Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston with Our Blooming Catholic Life and I'm here today with a bit of a reaction video. Now it's a reaction video both to a, um, a video I saw, which I don't have the ability to download a video and do that oh, 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 reaction, but also I wanted to give um, both an American point of view because this happened in Ireland and there is a video done by an Irishman and I'll link that below or maybe maybe I can put a link up there for you and I'm going to come in and say just from an American understanding what it was as well as when I went to do my nightly Bible reading literally every reading spoke to this issue so I wanted to come on and share that because so a, a little, tiny bit of an American point of view and it's mostly going to be the Holy Spirit's point of view so let's dive into this let's see here so what started out here is, da -da, here is the, the video. I'm trying to, oh, it's a little blurry for you. Let me read that. It says, of course, I'm going to keep turning. Irish Catholics told no genuflection to the tabernacle. Oh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not being able to, there we go. And the channel is called De Crevy Determined to be Catholic. And date's not on there. I think it was yesterday, but I'm not sure. Let's come over here. So what happened was in Ireland, um, just a bulletin, you know, church bulletin, like you grab when you're going out the doors and it normally has maybe a reflection of the gospel and a bunch of upcoming parish events. So this is the one that was given out. He said it was given out by the Redemptorist. You can see it was about the real presence. So it was Sunday. Oh, this is a while ago. So it was the 8th of May. 2022, fourth Sunday of Easter, it says year C, season color, white, Psalter, week four. And it has little boxes. So there's a little bit of a, ref it's funny, there's like a little summary of the gospel, a reflection box, a say box, a do box, and a learn box. So let's look at these different boxes. So first it has, it's kind of weird. It says the real presence, and it's a picture of a person lighting candles. I that should let you know there's something odd. Why is it not a picture of the Eucharist? Why is it a person lighting candles? Let's see. So the reading was John 10, 27 to 30. It says, Today's gospel extract comes from a discussion between Jesus and his opponents during the winter festival of the Feast of Dedication and is set within the temple in Jerusalem. All good, giving you a setting for it. It says here, The others have demanded that Jesus tell them plainly whether he is the Messiah or not. Jesus replies by giving them a description of the true believer, the kind of person who can accept Jesus' message, because unlike the people he is talking to, the individual that will accept Jesus on his own terms. You're kind of like, what? The others cannot receive him because their understanding is limited to their own ideas. The true believer, one of the sheep Jesus is talking about, hears and listens, follows, becomes a disciple, and thus receives eternal life, which means never being lost. To me, I'm just jumping in right there. That doesn't seem like Catholic teaching, saying that you can never be lost. There, there's still a thing called mortal sin. Be nice if we can never be lost, but that's not Catholic teaching right there. So that's, you, you, know, you see what I mean? There's, there's little red flags going off here. The Feast of the Dedication celebrates the reconsecration of the temple and its altar after it had been desecrated by pagan soldiers. In the building represented the presence of God among the people. Jesus, however, says, quote, the Father and I are one, end quote. We remember that elsewhere Jesus tells his disciple Philip that to see Jesus is to see the Father. There is now a different way to understand how God is present, not in a building, no matter how sacred, but rather in the person of Jesus. To believe in Jesus will then bring the disciple close, not only to Jesus, but also to God. In this way, Jesus is, in himself, replacing the temple as the focus of God's presence. There are mm, ambiguities in there, right? There are ambiguities in there. Right? there. Like, none of the he's or him's referring to Jesus are in capital. When it says, like, you can't understand God under your own ideas. Let's look up John. I did not do this before, so let's just go back here and let's look up John. I was in reading John already. 
Um, I'm a little bit past this, so let me get back. John ten eight. There we go. John ten. Did she twenty seven to thirty? Twenty seven to thirty. Let's see what we have here. Twenty seven to thirty. And Jesus answered them, I speak to you and you believe not. The works that I do in the name of my Father, they give testimony to me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them life everlasting and they shall not perish forever. And no man shall pluck them out of my hand. That which my Father has given me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of the hand of my Father. I and the Father are one. And then the Jews take up stones to to um, stone him. Interesting because, okay, the little excerpt here says just 27 through 30, which is just the, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them life everlasting. They shall not perish forever. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. That which the father has given me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of the hand of my father. And I and the father are one. It's interesting that they chose such a small section to speak to um, it does say and here it's saying their understanding of Jesus is limited to their own ideas and then talks about the true believer but it doesn't say in this reflection over here that the people believe because God has already given them the grace to believe that grace is not mentioned in this little booklet at all that's a little odd right there but it does make it sound um, like nothing can ever happen to you. But it's because of the grace of the Father, not because of anything that you do. Um, that's clear to me when I'm reading it, but it does not seem to be there. That which my Father has given me. Sorry, here. The Father has given grace. So let's go on to this article. It had... Um, I'm going to keep the last juiciest section for last. So it wants you to say, the sheep that belong to me, listen to my voice. Good right there. That's John 10, 27. So I'm guessing it's a little memory verse. It says, do light a candle. And so maybe this is what the candles were at the beginning. There's another picture of candles. Light a candle and spend some time thinking about how God is present to you in the person of the risen Jesus. Why? Why are you lighting the candle then? They're emphasizing that, that Jesus is there and it's a person. And then why, why would you light a candle? That is contradictory right there and interesting that they have that. They have no explanation why you would light the candle. But they're saying in the person of the reason, risen Jesus. And they just tell you, again, learn the Feast of the Dedication celebrated the reconsecration of the temple and its altar has been desecrated in the century before Jesus. So now we're going to come over to the big controversial one. What is meant by the reflect box? I have that. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it if I hold it up. Can you read that? You may be able to read that. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. That got weird. My phone started flashing at the iPad. Maybe they were talking to each other. Reflect. So this is... Here, I believe he said this was given out by the Redemptorists in Ireland. So we are accustomed to talking about and hearing about the, and then it uses a single quote mark about the real presence. And then another one. I don't know what the, that, that is about. That's weird. I've never seen a single quote around something quite like that in there. I'm finding that odd. Why is that there? Uh, I've never seen that around real presence. So we are accustomed to talking and hearing about real presence. This expression normally refers to the reserved Eucharistic sacrament, which is kept in the tabernacle in the church. This phrase states our belief that Jesus is truly present in the consecrated bread and wine. However, it may get the impression that this is the only way in which Jesus is here among us. So to me, when it talks about the phrase states our belief that Jesus is present in the consecrated bread and wine, he's not even saying, it doesn't even go to say that it's the body and blood of Christ. I don't think it, it ever says that in this reflect piece. And so you're like, that's odd. Why do they keep saying consecrated bread and wine and Eucharistic sacrament 
in real presence, but they're not saying body and blood of Christ. There's a reason they're not saying it. However, it may give the impression that this is the only way in which Jesus is here among us. If your red flags aren't, aren't, aren't like going like crazy, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> they should be. Back, back to the actual text. One of the reforms of the liturgy at Vatican II, this is not true, was to recommend the removal of the tabernacle from the high altar to a side chapel. This came after Vatican II. It may be one of those things that was kind of, um, maybe, maybe a seed of it was mentioned in Vatican II documents, but this, the author of the main video has researched it heavily and cannot find it in the official documents of the official Vatican II. This, this monkey business came afterwards. And the way it has always been described to me in my classes is that it was for a very small, specific set of churches, very historical churches that attracted a lot of tourists who were not Catholic and did not believe in the real presence. So as they're going around the church and they're gawking at the gorgeous artwork and learning about the history of the country that it's in, because a lot of times, you know, countries have taken over churches um, and may allow Catholics to use them, but they're more historical treasures of the state. And so people were running around gawking, taking pictures. They'd walk up to the tabernacle. So it was being very disrespectful um, because it was a tourist and not a religious pilgrim. And so they said in those instances, if that is going on, if you have, first of all, if you have one of those big historic places and you're getting a lot of tourists who are not Catholic and are not being um, respectful to the Eucharist in the tabernacle, then consider moving it off to a side chapel or a side altar that is reserved for the faithful. And so you're not getting the tourists being disrespectful to our Lord. So it was a very narrow circumstance. It was not in the Vatican II documents. This was a small accommodation. It was all it was supposed to be for very rare circumstances where our Lord was being disrespectful because he's housed in a tourist trap. <sighs> That's a whole nother issue. But back to our little reflect. Some people took this as a lack of respect for the Blessed Sacrament. Again, it will use euphemisms, right? Blessed Sacrament. But the directive was making an important point. Okay, maybe the authors of the document secretly had this point, but this is not anything that is explicit in any document talking about this. Um, not that I've ever seen or found. If you have found it, put it in the comments below and we'll discuss it. They're saying, when the community assembles to celebrate the Eucharist together, Christ is present in the congregation in as valid a way as in the consecrated bread and wine. Again, they won't taste the body, but great. Hence, there should be no genuflection to the tabernacle as Christ is present among his disciples in just as real, though different, a way. Jesus tells us that where two or three gather in his name, he is, quote, in their midst. This is borderline. There, did you see that fine line there between that and Eastern religions? And I'm not talking about Eastern Orthodox. I'm talking about truly Eastern religions which are like animism, uh, Tai Chi, that sort of thing, which have kind of Buddhist things, which, which honor a life force, a uh, life energy source. And they're saying that life force and energy is in all of us and they will bow to each other because that life energy in me sees the light energy in you. Although people like to use the word light in me sees the light in you. They're not talking about God. And if they are talking about God, they, they are not talking about the one true God when they do that. So reject that. Don't get into that practice. That is not a true Christian practice. Did you, do you hear the disciples doing that at all? Did Jesus do that? Did even John the Baptist go up and do that when, when Christ and the disciples were there? We don't hear of that. We don't hear of that bowing and the light in me. Like, could, cause John could have done that. He was a fairly holy person. So if this were true, did we hear John going up? Oh, the God in me sees the God in you. He did not do that. Stop that, friends. Stop that. Um, is, is Jesus present among us? Are we the body of Christ? But we're not. Let's not start worshiping each other. Don't do that. Christ is present in other ways. Back to the document, of course. For instance, when we pray, when we read the scriptures, when we minister to our brothers and sisters, Jesus tells us that he and the Father are one, and so God's presence is mediated to the disciple through him. Which is odd, because then it's saying God's presence. Well, well, what God are you saying? 
maybe they'd have to say the Trinitarian God's presence is mediated to the disciple through Jesus. I don't know. This is getting really weird at the end. In this way, Jesus himself is the real presence. And he and God are not confined to any building or ritual. Okay, Jesus is not confined to any building or ritual. But is he physically present in the Eucharist? Yeah, so that's different than him being spiritually present. They are two different things. Um, okay, but, but Jesus in the Eucharist, you can get him physically and spiritually. So we're talking about a physical thing. And there is a spiritual reality that we all know if you've seen some old catechism, catechism documents, right? Catechism. Teaching documents, some old teaching documents. They will show you like the mass and you see, you know, the altar servers and the altar and the priest up there. And they're like, what really happens? And it shows you all the angels who are filled in the building, packed, you know, full of angels adoring God. And so there is a spiritual reality as well as the physical reality. And I'm not saying that's not true. And is the Eucharist more precious to us than the tabernacle? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is saying, but Jesus is in the people. So we don't need to care about that. So it literally says that you should not genuflect. Hence, there should be no genuflection to the tabernacle. If Christ is present among his disciples in just as real, though different away, Jesus tells us that where two or three are gathered, he is in their midst. So quit being reverent to God, people. What's wrong with you? Do you believe that really was given out in a church by priests who wrote that? That's insanity. Um... Don't, don't follow them. And here's, uh, last night I was doing my Bible in a Year reading. I'm doing the Dr. Taylor Marshall plan. And all of the readings spoke to this. All of them. I hope you're still watching, friends, because this is so important. Um, so I'm in 4th Kings. Your Bible may call it 2nd Kings. This is the 1899 version of, of the Holy Bible that I have. Um, and so I am back in chapter 16 page four or five. And, and in these chapters of Kings, these are the Kings that reigned after King Solomon. Um, there's normally one King for Israel and one King for Judah. And they'll tell you where in the reign of the King of Israel, the new King of Judah comes in. And whenever they talk about a King of Israel, they'll tell you they'll relate it to the King of Judah where in his reign. So they're always drawing those connections. So you know exactly what time they're talking about. And they may focus on Judah in one chapter. In the next chapter, they're going to focus on what happened during that same time period. In, in Israel. And then normally they nail, tell you the new king's name. They tell you what how he followed the Lord if he followed him, how he did not follow the Lord if he did not follow him. And one of the ways that even the best of them so far have not done is apparently um, there, there were high places, high places, and groves where people would still make sacrifices to pagan idols. So even if they followed in the ways of the Lord, that's one line they didn't cross. They didn't get rid of those high places where people were sacrificing to pagan idols. So this is why chapter 16 is so important. Because here um, we have in the 17th year of Phasi, the son of Romilia reigned Achaz, the son of Joatham, king of Judah. Please don't get on my pronunciation. Achaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not that, oh, which is pleasing in the sight of the Lord as his God, as David, his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Moreover, oh, he's doubling down, friends. He consecrated also his son, making him pass through the fire according to the idols of the nations, which the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So not only did he not take those places away, he did it himself. And then Razan, king of Syria, and Phasi, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to fight. And they besieged Achaz, but they were not able to overcome him. And at that time, Razan, king of Syria, restored Aya to Syria and drove the men of Judah out of Aya. But the Edomites came to Aya and dwelt there unto this day. And Achaz sent messengers to Theglathphalasar, king of the Assyrians, saying, oh, I am thy servant and thy son. So he's giving up the sovereignty of the kingdom of, who is he? King of Judah. He's giving it up. He's saying, we'll be servants to Assyria if you save me from the king of Syria and out of the king of Israel who are risen up together against me. When he gathered together all the gold and silver that could be found in the house of the Lord. So he's stealing from God. That's going to go well. 
into the king's treasures. He sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. He gets worse. You're thinking it's not going to get worse. We say this in our day and age. Like this article just came out. We thought it couldn't get worse. There's people denying the real presence. And now they're saying, well, it's the real presence. But, you know, I mean, but God's everywhere. So why is it special? What is Christmas and special? They're really saying that. God, forgive me for saying that out loud. I'm saying they were saying that. Because um, next he... uh, goes up. So King Antiochus goes to Damascus to meet the king of the Assyrians. And when he had seen the altar of Damascus, he sent to Urias the priest, the pattern of it, and the likeness according to all the work thereof. And Urias the priest built the altar according to all that King Antiochus had commanded from Damascus, and so did Urias the priest, until King Antiochus came from Damascus. And when the king was come from Damascus, he saw the altar and he worshipped it, the pagan altar, he worshipped it, and went off and offered holocausts as own sacrifice, and offered libations, and poured the blood of the peace offering, which he had offered upon the altar, but the altar of brass that was before the Lord. He had removed from the face of the temple and from the place of the altar and from the place of the temple, the Lord, and he set it at the side of the altar towards the north. And King Atchas commanded Urias, the priest, saying, upon the great altar, offer the morning holocaust and the evening sacrifice and the king's holocaust and his sacrifice and the holocaust of the whole people of the land and their sacrifices and their libations and all the blood of the holocaust and all the blood of the victim thou shalt pour out upon it. But the altar of the brass shall just be ready at my pleasure. So Urias the king did according, so, sorry, Urias the priest did according to all that the king Atchas had commanded him. And then king Atchas took away all the graven bases and the laver that was upon them. And he took down the sea in the, from the brazen oxen that held it up. And he put upon it a pavement of stone. Does it sound familiar, friends? So he built a new altar removed the old altar off to the side, said he was going to use it for himself. And then he took down all the statues and decorations and he plastered over them. Sound familiar, doesn't it? This has all happened before, friends. The warning flags should be going off. And the Musach also for the Sabbath, which he had built in the temple. And the king's entry from without, he turned into the temple of the Lord because of the king of the Assyrians. And he passed away. Now the reign of O.C., the Israelites for their sins are carried into captivity and other inhabitants are sent to Syria, sorry, Samaria, and make a mixture of religion. So the kings of Israel, so we were just talking about Judah, so now we're going back to Israel. And Israel did, <laughs> right here, uh, O.C., the son of Ella, reigned in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did evil before the Lord. Not just didn't walk in the ways of the Lord, he did evil before the Lord but not as the kings of Israel that had been before him. And against him came the king of the Assyrians, and O.C. became his servant, and he paid him tribute. When the king of the Assyrians found that O.C. endeavoring to rebel, he sent messengers to the king of Egypt that he would not pay tribute to the king of the Assyrians as he had done every year. He besieged him, and bound him, and he cast him into prison. And he went through all the land, and going up to Samaria, he besieged it for three years. And in the ninth year of O.C., the king of the Assyrians took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria, and he placed them in Hala and Habar by the river of Gozan in the cities of Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and they worshipped strange gods. And they walked according to the way of the nations, which the Lord had destroyed in the sight of the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, because they had done in like manner. And the children of Israel offended the Lord their God with things that were not right, and built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And they made them statues and groves on every hill and under every shady tree. And they burnt incense there upon altars after the manner of the nations which the Lord had removed from their face. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord. And they worshipped abominations concerning which the Lord had commanded them that they should not do this thing. And the Lord testified to them in Israel and in Judah by the hand of all the prophets and seers, saying, Return from your wicked ways and keep my precepts and ceremonies according to all the laws which I commanded your fathers. And as I have sent to you in the hand of my servants, the prophets, and they hearkened not, but they hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers, who would not obey the Lord their God. And they rejected his ordinances and the covenant he made with their fathers and the testimonies with which he testified against them. And they followed vanities and acted vainly. And they followed the nations that were round about them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them that they should not do as they did. And they forsook all the precepts of the Lord their God. And they made to themselves two molten calves and groves and adored all the hosts of heaven, and they served Baal. 
And they consecrated their sons and their daughters through fire, and they gave themselves to divination and soothsayings, and they delivered themselves up to do evil before the Lord to provoke him. Provoke him. You know, like taking the rainbow, the sign that God would never destroy man again, and using it as a symbol of a sinful behavior that he has told you not to do. Yeah. So they provoked him. And the Lord was very angry with Israel, and they removed them from his sight, and they remained only the tribe of Judah. But... Neither did Judah keep itself the commandments of the Lord their God, but they walked in the errors of Israel which they had wrought. And the Lord cast off all the seed of Israel, and afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers. So he cast them away from his face. Even from that time when Israel was rent from the house of David, and Jeroboam son of Nebat their king, for Jeroboam separated Israel from the Lord, and made them commit a great sin. And the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he had done, and they departed not from them, till the Lord removed Israel from his face, as he had spoken in the hand of all his servants, the prophets, and Israel was carried away out of the land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of the Assyrians brought the people from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Emeth and from Seraphim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And when they began to dwell there, they feared not the Lord, and the Lord sent lions among them, which killed them. It was told the king of the Assyrians, it was said this, The nations which thou hast removed and made to dwell in the cities of Samaria know not the ordinances of the God of the land, and the Lord has sent lions among them, and behold, they kill them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. So the Assyrians are seeing something wrong. They know that, that God needs to be worshipped. But the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests that you have brought from thence captive, and let him go and dwell among them, and let them teach the ordinances of God of the land. So one of the priests who had been carried away captive from Samaria, they send one, they send one in, and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should worship the Lord. And every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the temples of the high places, which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities where they dwelt. So the idea was to send him in, and he was going to, you know, get everyone to work together and worship God. So they start worshiping all their pagan idols at the same time they're worshiping God. Does that also sound familiar? People sacrificing children and also going in to worship God. This is not going to go well, friends. If you want to know, you could read this handy dandy guide that tells you. And then it goes on and we go to the king of Judah and wait. Who do we have here? Ezekias, the son of Achaz, the king of Judah. And he did that which was good before the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. And he destroyed the high places and broke the statues in pieces and cut down the groves. And he broke the brazen serpent, which Moses had made. For till now, the children of Israel had burnt incense to it. I'm not going to say his name. They give his name here. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him, there was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any of them that were before him. And he stuck to the Lord, and he departed not from his steps, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Wherefore, the Lord was also with him, and in all things to which he went forth, he behaved himself wisely, and he rebelled against the king of the Assyrians, and he served him not. He smote the Philistines. And it goes on. And then, remember that when the king of the Assyrians carried away Israel into Assyria, and he, and he had done that. So this is we're at this moment when this good king of Judah is going to find out. So now the king of the Assyrians is coming up to Judah and he took them. Then Ezekiel, the king of Judah, sent messengers to the king of the Assyrians saying, I have offended, depart from me and all that thou shalt put upon me, I will bear. And the king of the Assyrians put a tax upon Ezekiel, king of Judah of 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Ezekiel is saying, whoops. And even, even he, even he gives in. And he goes and he gives all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the king's treasures. And at that time, Ezekiel broke the doors of the temple of the Lord and the plates of gold which he had fastened on them and he gave them to the king of the Assyrians. He's literally dismantling the temple and giving it to the king of the Assyrians. This is not going to go well. And then they come out to mock him. They come out to mock him because they're coming up to Jerusalem and they're calling to the people. They're like, your, your God's not going to save you. Don't believe your king. Your God's not going to save you. You're so weak. It's not going to happen. Um, and the king said, oh, that's what it's saying. 
They're saying, don't trust in your God. Don't trust in him. This is chapter 18. They're saying, have any of the gods of the nations delivered their land from the hand of the Assyrians? Nope, none of them. And they list them all. None of these saved them. And they say, who among all the gods of the nations that have delivered their country out of my hand, that the Lord may deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? The people held their peace. The people of Judah, they held their peace and answered him not a word, for they had received commandment from the king that they should not answer him. And Elisim, the son of Halcius, who was over the house, and Sabna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Aspa, the recorder, came to Ezekiel with their garments rent, and they told him the words of Rasmus. And the king rents his clothes, and he, he sends for the prophet, and he starts doing penance right away. And I'm just saying... That seems to be the way. And he prayed in his sight, saying, O Lord God of Israel, who sitteth upon the cherubim, thou alone art the God of all the kings of the earth. Thou madest heaven and earth. Incline thy ear and hear. Open, O Lord, thy eyes and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, who sent the upgrade unto us, the living God. O of a truth, O Lord, the kings of the Assyrians have destroyed nations and the lands of them all, and they have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of man's hands, of wood and stone, and they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from this hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, the only God. And Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Ezekiel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I have heard the prayer that thou hast made concerning the king of the Assyrians. This is the word that the Lord has spoken of him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath wagged her head behind thy back. Who hast thou reproached, and whom hast thou blasphemed against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thy eyes on highs against the Holy One of Israel? See, it is not going to go well. But out of Jerusalem, jumping over to 31, shall go forth a remnant, and that which shall be saved out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the war, Lord of hosts shall do this. So it became a smaller church and a holier church. And when I went, friends, to the... um. Job, it was, the reading was Job, Job chapter 1, and here's Job being very parallel, right? Job got up, all this terrible stuff, like Job had been a really good guy, all this terrible stuff had gone, gone on. Oh, before that, they used to go to feasts, they would have a feast at each of the kids' houses, and when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent to them and sanctified them, and rising up early, offered holocaust for every one of them, for he said, lest perhaps my sons have sinned, and have blessed God in their hearts. So did Job all his days. So not only was he good, but he was preemptively offering prayer and sacrifice for his children just in case, just in case they might sin. And then we all know the Lord allowed Satan to test him because Satan was saying, well, of course he, he loves you. you. You do all these great things for him. What else is he going to do? So let me do a couple, a couple things and we'll see what goes. Well, it's a couple really horrible things, but Job is not hurt. And as Job hears this list of all these horrible things that have befallen him and his property and his children, he rose up, rent his garments, just like the king we just heard, rose up, rent his garments, having shaven his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. As it has pleased the Lord, so it is done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these things, Job sinned not by his lips, nor spoke he any foolish thing against God. Don't say those foolish things. They're there. Right? We just heard them a minute ago. And then I was supposed to come over to, uh, I'm in John chapter 15. And he's telling us about how he is the true vine and my father is the true husbandman. And he says on and on. Oh, he's saying how I have to go. Sorry. I, oh, oh, here's my note. <laughs> it's over here on this next page. I had two things. So it's John 16. And I'm back here at 21. A woman, when she, uh, he says, amen. Sorry, up at 20. Amen, amen, I say to you that you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. 
and you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she hath brought forth a child, she remembers no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. And I'm going to jump over to verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you shall have peace, in the world you shall have distress, but have confidence. I have overcome the world. And I was ready to leave it there because what are the odds that my Marian reading was going to have anything to speak to this? And I opened it up and I read such a little section in here. And this brings it back. So the Lord was saying, yes, there are all these trials, but have heart. You're going to have beautiful joy should you stay faithful to me. And that's such an encouragement. And then to bring it back to the Eucharist, apparently the Holy Spirit wanted me to read in here um, on page 65. This is in the very plastic version of the Imitation of Mary. Be mindful of the precious, innocent blood that your beloved son, Jesus Christ, shed for me when dying. Sorry, <laughs> shed when dying for me, a sinner. Be mindful of his pure side and of all the tears you yourself shed throughout your life and take pity on me. For you I long, in your merits I trust, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Amen. Reminding us, friends, again, of the real presence of Christ, of the real sacrifice. Are we, are we the body of Christ? Yes. And that is an amazing and wonderful mystery. But does it, it pales in comparison to the mystery of the self-giving love of God and the fact that he becomes present to us again in and when the bread and the wine is changed into his body and blood that we may receive. And that is such a beautiful sacrament and miracle. And it's amazing. Why, why would God, the God of the universe who created everything, humble him so much to be like a little, a little piece of, of bread and wine? That little bit. That humility. The amazing humility of it, it all. And I will continue. I don't know about you, friends, but I will continue to kneel and to genuflect at the Eucharist and at the tabernacle. May God bless you, friends.